So well, thank you for taking the time for doing this today. Of course. Really do appreciate that. Um, let me start by saying in the nicest way possible, you scared the shit out of me with Chernobyl. Um, so much so that I bought radiation kits, iodine tablets, and everything else that's as grim and cynical as possible that you can find on Amazon. And they're in my uh, in my emergency box now. If, if it makes you feel any better, I did the exact same thing. <laughs> well, it was a brilliant series, though, really. Yeah. I was hoping to like it. And I seriously, it's one of the best pieces of, of entertainment as a whole that I can recall. Uh, right. Just on so many levels, from right. just just the the score alone, like it's mm. haunting. Mm. So, Hilder, but yep. he's amazing. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. But let's get into the Last of Us. Um, and actually, what actually? Well, let me go back a little bit further. I just wonder where did you your interest in telling stories begin, and how did it go from making people laugh to terrifying millions? That's a really interesting question. I I feel like I've been doing it my whole life. Um, my sister and I are very close in age. We're like, I'm a year and a half older than her, which is basically the same age when you're little kids. And all of our, the play that we engaged in at home was always narrative. We always were creating stories. Um, it just seemed, uh, it seemed like it was the way I organized my thoughts about the world and experienced things was through narrative. Less so than I think a lot of people who do what I do grew up absorbing a lot of narrative through television and film. And I didn't. We weren't really allowed to watch much television at home. And we didn't have a lot of money. So there weren't a lot of trips out to the movies. I mean, I, you know, I saw the big ones. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was just the way I played. It was play. And that never changed. I think what I do for a living is really an extension of that. It's play. Um, but the play, obviously, as you get older, becomes more and more sophisticated. In comedy, I think the comedy is, is I think, more intellectually rigorous than drama. I think a lot of people find that confusing, but it's simply a fact. Um, comedy is very carefully designed. It's calculated. It's refined it comes down to timing and it's it's virtuosic really i think um drama is more emotionally complicated it requires you to be vulnerable and to be honest and to explore things that make you scared or sad uh comedy tends to uh mock the absurdity of our existence and drama tends to confront the sadness of our mortality. And these are two sides of the same coin, but ultimately, I think I just like playing, whether it's that way or this way. You started with comedy, though, is career-wise, and then mm -hmm. you've now over the last two projects, especially, you've sunk deeply into more dramatic, um, was that always in you and you're waiting to unleash that or you know is it, or was it something that kind of grew as you matured as a writer i think it was always there um i've always been interested in in all sorts of things um and i don't think this is an extension of being being older i just honestly it more than anything um it it is a manifestation of the exhaustion of doing comedy for as long as I did. Comedy is really hard. And, and um, when it works, people basically say you've achieved the minimum requirement. And when it fails, they, you know, tear you apart. Uh, it's not, you know, comedy is, is expressed in terms of killing and bombing. It's all very violent. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just tiring. And also I think that it is hard as you get older to stay as funny as you used to be because a lot of what comedy is is about being completely soaking in the current of the churn of new culture and relevance is difficult so i'm you know any late night talk show host certainly has a bunch of 
you know, women and men in their twenties and thirties writing for them and explaining the jokes <laughs> because <laughs> you just, that's how it goes. You know, my, you know, my children are 18 and 21 and, you know, it's just different. Right. So partly it was, it was a, an acknowledgement that I was starting to age and slip out of the mainstream of culture that churns into comedy and um, part of it was just, yeah, exhaustion from writing comedy. It's just very, very hard. I get it. So expectations were all over the place for this series. You had the, you know, the video game fans, but people who didn't know it as well probably came in, well, I've heard, coming in with kind of more of an expect expectations of like a, a horror series or shoot them up. And, and while it does have some elements of those, there's so much more on, yeah. on top of that. There's the grief, the environmental messaging, the social political, there's even some romance in there. So what was your, what were your goals or some of your goals coming into this series? And were they always as ambitious as the final product was? Oh, they were certainly that ambitious. I mean, the goals and the hopes are always, should always be more ambitious than what you end up with. I mean, we aim or as high as we can. And then the struggle of writing and producing and editing and finishing is about forcing this thing to get as close to that ideal as possible. It's just, you know, when for television, because I'm in charge of television, I was never in charge of the movies, but I'm in charge of television. And when I'm in charge, my goal is to make the greatest possible thing I can. And that means to force everything to get better and better and better as you go and to never be complacent and to never feel like, oh, you know, I'm the Chernobyl guy. I merely have to sprinkle Chernobyl yeah. dust all over this. And Chernobyl dust doesn't sound very good, does it? Um, no, no. <laughs> I'll um, get you kicked out of most. Uh, off most yeah, <laughs> it'll definitely trip off a few uh, sensors. But um, I think the whole point of adapting the last of us was to take something that i thought was great in a medium in fact the greatest for me it was the greatest game i played in a medium a medium that i'm extremely familiar with and a medium that i keep up with even as i age and to adapt it and the adaptation part is incredibly important to adapt it mm -hmm. and in the adaptation, aspire to something that is just as great in this medium. Now, harder to be great in television than in video games, uh, only because there have been, I think, more great things, just the volume of great things. You know, there's just look at the list of the 50 best television shows, and it's mind blowing, right? In terms of story, I want to be clear about this in terms of story, there are 50 incredible video games, but in terms of video game stories, I don't know that we could list 50 great ones and go, oh my God, those are right up there with Breaking Bad and Sopranos and all that. So, because video games have play and television does not. So television's only story, that's all it has. So in the adaptation of that, trying to, trying to create something that could stand up there with other great shows, that was the intention. And knowing that we had the ability to do that because we were working with such a great story to begin with, was the point i mean i have this enormous passion for for the last of us no and no it's passion <laughs> it really is it was the same it honestly was the same feeling i had about chernobyl in that once i started reading about it and i just became passionate and i think that's what ends up making me want to make everything better and better and better as as i go and what were some of the toughest decisions as you're looking for that balance? Because you're bringing it from a video game with these ex expectations, but you're also working directly with, you know, the man behind the video game, Neil Druckmann. So, I mean, I'm sure that's helpful, but that's also, you've got a very high bar because he's not going to accept anything but, you know, but perfect. Well, right? I have the same bar. <laughs> so the key with Neil is Neil understood the concept of adaptation. and. And he is, I think, unique as a source material creator in that he understood the point of adaptation and was always willing to try anything to carry the show forward in a way that was clearly inspired by and faithful to the story that he had created for the game 
but also then did other things that in their originality would reflect the intention and mood and feeling of the source material. Even when we went 180 degrees, like we did with Bill in a sense, mm -hmm. um, it was always about uh, enhancing the spirit of what that was. So he understood that. The challenges that we had um, were the normal challenges, I think. Um, we had a great story. We had a great ending. And I think that's, you know, to me, endings are everything. Um, when we disagreed about things, we followed a, a rule that uh, Johan Rank and I had on Chernobyl, which was, well, let's keep talking until we agree. <laughs> that's it. And that doesn't mean that we have to, I have to vote for yours or you have to vote for mine. Maybe there's a third way. And the important thing about those discussions is you need to have faith that the other person only cares about what is best for the show and does not care about their own ego, insecurities, whatever. It's just about what's best. And that's how it was for me and Neil. And I'm the the things that I remember from those disagreements are the things where he was right and I ended up agreeing with him. Those are the ones I remember. Uh, you know, the ones where he agreed with me, I don't know, it's just those don't those just whew, were gone. But uh it was a great partnership. He is a great partner and he's a good friend. And it's uh exciting um to think that we get to keep doing this for, you know, hopefully quite some time. So the approach is kind of let's agree to not disagree eventually. Let's agree to not disagree. Exactly. Because yeah. the thing is, we can't, there's no value in going ahead with one person, you know, just feeling acid in their stomach going, we're, we're, we're screwing it up. We're doing something that, that is wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to be going, the, the worst possible thing for me would be to force a victory in a, in a you know debate and then go forward, do what I want to do. And then just know that he's back there going, the hell was that? It's just wrong, you know? So we just agreed to agree, uh, you know, by talking yeah. it through, figuring it out on everything. And look, honestly, I'm, I'm overemphasizing this because it's interesting. 97% of the time, we agreed right off the bat. <laughs> there wasn't any argument at all. So yeah, I mean, that's really a testament, I think, to to his elasticity and adapticity. Uh, oh, I just made a new word, adapticity, as, <laughs> as, a, as a creator. It's kind of like this world, though, and if we only did take that approach, maybe we wouldn't be having some of the issues that we seem to be having, especially over this last decade, that we can't agree to, uh, try to agree. It's, you know, everyone puts their foot down and says, this is where I stand, and pretty much you're not going to convince me otherwise. So this approach is great, and I will, I'm going to take it into uh, into some of my creative uh, Hopefully. endeavors. <laughs> okay. Um, but so you mentioned episode three, which is a fan favorite, which is just a beautiful episode and completely threw me because I, I only started the game. I've been wanting to play the game for mm. years. And when the it was announced, when it was announced that not only was HBO going to be doing this, but you would be involved. I was like, OK, I have to watch it day one. So I picked up the game, started playing, but I only played as much as I could you know, have the willpower not to up to where I was in the series. Oh, so okay. That's good. As I'm seeing these things unfold, I was like, well, I don't remember this part. Like maybe did I play not, not enough or too, <laughs> too much or, you know, I, or did I forget something? I don't know. But when it all, you know, episode three plays out, it's, it's just, I mean, it's so many different levels. Um, it, it makes me emotional thinking of it because of the uh, 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 Murray's character. Yeah. Um, with some personal connections there and, and just, you know, I mean, so I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you a question here eventually. <laughs> sure, that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> um, why did you want to add this to the story? What was it about it? And like, what were your kind of not goals, but, you know, you, you injected so much more into the into the series than people had expected uh, yeah. and, and it resonated, but it also had deeper messaging with like the bigger themes and connecting to it. So why, why was this the story you wanted to add? Well, this was an area where... Um, I felt the most freedom because Neil, um, you know, as he's pointed out many times, one of the limitations that he had as a storyteller was that 
the perspective of the story was always tied to either Joel or Ellie later in the game. You you take over as Ellie and then you go back to being Joel. But that's it. That's just because of the nature of gameplay. That's who you are. We don't have that limitation. So one of the things that was interesting about Bill in the game is that you only encounter him through Joel and Ellie. He becomes a little bit of a, a kind of a sidekick and a mission helper. But what he what he represented in the game was um, the ultimate failure that Joel could experience as someone who closed himself off so completely from the potential for emotional pain that he had become isolated and angry and um, incapable, really, of coexisting with anybody. And the one person that he cared about, he pushed away. And when you find Frank, Frank's dead. Frank has hanged himself and written one of the meanest suicide notes anyone could have ever written. Yeah. Um, and so that was the point of that in the game. And what I thought was given the freedom that I had to tell that story, maybe from Bill's perspective, it gave me a couple of opportunities. I mean, just intellectually, as I was thinking about it, one, I felt like it would be good to see how the 20 years had kind of gone. This passage of time between the breakout of the um, of the infection, the outbreak, and now. So, but I didn't want to do like a. I just I thought telling stories through a relationship really is the key. Uh, I'm just I don't believe that as a writer. I know everybody talks about character. All I ever talk about is relationship because I think it's relationship that defines character, and. I didn't want to tell the story of a man alone. There's no relationship. Therefore, there's no definition of character. I mean, when you look at Bill in the beginning of the episode, when he's alone, he is a perfectly settled person. There, there is no, there are characteristics, <laughs> but we don't understand character until there is a relationship. So I thought that was an opportunity. I thought also that we had an obligation because I'm always thinking about the audience to give them a breather. Um, we had gone through two pretty intense episodes. People that we had invested in and cared about had died. Joel and Ellie are left alone now for the first time. And it struck me that there was an opportunity to tell a story that gave the audience evidence that victory was possible in this world that love was possible, that two kinds of love, this outward nurturing love and this, what I would call an inward protective love could coexist together evenly and feed into each other in a beautiful way and create a long, a longstanding relationship that is about, that was loving and that functioned. It's really important, I think, to show that functioning could occur, otherwise, What's the point of watching Joel and Ellie go through this world knowing that everybody dies and nothing ever functions? Mm -hmm. But the oh. most important thing was ultimately to have, for me, was to have Bill go through an experience in his life that ultimately led him to realize what it was all about and to put that down on paper and to leave it behind for Joel. So, Joel, who starts that episode, angry at Ellie and cold and dark, eventually reads that note, understands that Bill has defined Joel and his purpose, but there is no more Tess. And thus all that is left for Joel to do is manifest who he's supposed to be by taking Ellie with him. And that's, that was how that all came to be. Uh, but yeah, what, I mean, your response there is, is, uh... It's incredible. It's, it's, you know, people always think that these things just come together and there's no thought, but I'm like, gosh, you know, I mean, this is just a, a two minute long answer. If, if that, you must put months, days, you know, weeks, whatever, into developing that idea and, and then bringing it to life. And like, it, you know, as you know, it affected a lot of people. Um, yeah, it, it did. And it's, it's and and I the, on, honestly sometimes when I think about it I get a little scared because I don't quite 
this is the thing about writing is I can't quite explain exactly how it happened. I mean, I can explain what the thinking process was, but all of that is sort of intellectual. I can't quite explain why strawberries, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know how I, mm -hmm. and so it gets scary sometimes when I think I have to do it again, because I just think, well, I can't do that again, but I can, I just, <laughs> I just have to, uh, you know, let, let myself play is really what it comes down to. You just play and more than anything, don't, as a writer, don't let yourself off the hook. Don't, if it doesn't feel special, then it's not special, you know, and just keep thinking until it's special. I, you know, if you spend five days just thinking and then something special and you write it, you'll be so much happier than with whatever you were going to write for over those five days that wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a frustrating process and it's uneven and it's frightening and every victory of writing just generates fear that it's the last good thing you'll write. And we're, you know, writers are a bit messy. <laughs> I don't think that's a secret. <laughs> so you, you also, some other great moments of writing are those two cold opens, mm. which go from, you know, what series is this? Well, the first episode, I'm like, what, you know, this is how we're starting this. This is not that, you know, for people who play the game, this is not where we begin. Mm. And then, uh, to chill down my spine and still probably some of the most frightening stuff. And it's just people talking. There's nothing, you know, yeah. no jump scares or anything like that. It's just combining science and, uh, yeah. and I guess our own fears and our own uh, uh, mortality, I guess. Um, what was it? How, why do you think that was so effective? And, and were there ever plans to have more cold openings? Because although they're tough to watch, I could definitely... <laughs> Yeah. Feel well, that again. those openings, um, you have to be careful with those. You know, if you do one for every episode, and I think people got excited and thought, oh, every episode is going to have one of these things. It becomes mm -hmm. a bit de rigueur and you start to feel like you're just being gimmicked every time. I mean, the key is do it when there's a call for it, you know, when it feels like it's useful. Um, and I think it's mostly useful early on in a season um, to help contextualize things um once you get going get going um you know i'm kind of that guy um uh the the one the first episode that that one with the talk show that was actually the first thing i wrote uh and it was way way back um even before i think we had broken the story of the season it was something i'd written and sent to uh johan rank who originally was going to direct the pilot but um covid just, you know, moved everyone's schedules around. And I sent it to him, but I didn't tell him I'd written it. I told him I had found it as a transcript and I wrote it as like a transcript style. And I sent it to him and he was like, he's like, oh my God. So we, they, they already knew, they knew. And I was like, ha, I got you. <laughs> but, but I, what I wanted to do there was pretty much that was to say, it's not like when this show starts, it happens to be the same day that this crazy thing happens. That's not the way crazy things happen. That's one of the lessons of Chernobyl. We think that a nuclear reactor explodes in a moment. It doesn't. It explodes after years of being preparing to explode. And the same thing happens with pandemics. It's only sudden to us, but it's not sudden. It's been working behind the scenes quietly. There are things that we have not yet experienced that right now, are happening. We just don't know. And what I thought was really interesting was to say this was inevitable. It didn't happen suddenly. It happened finally. And the warnings that we receive from scientists who know uh, are ignored. Every time we ignore all of them, it doesn't matter. We just ignore them. And we ignore them because they're because they're scary, and because also sometimes we're not really sure what we're supposed to do. What do you do? Um, and uh, I find that frightening. I find I find certainty when scientists are certain. It's frightening. There are ec economists who will go on television and tell you that the stock market is going to crash tomorrow, and uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but scientists are science <laughs> and and so similarly we we wanted to show in the cold open in the second episode that this was global 
uh, the game really just is all about the United States. Our show is all about the United States. But there was this moment where we wanted to say, hey, look, this actually impacts the whole world. We are not alone here. Um, we are in the United States, a fairly small island of people in our own strange, you know, North and South America way. There's this other huge area with way more people than we have, um, all of whom are affected. And to show um, a scientist very quickly arriving to the only possible conclusion, and that conclusion is that everybody, including her, must die, was, um, I thought, the most effective way to underscore that we knew. And that's important. Otherwise, it's just something that happens. Mm -hmm. I don't find that particularly interesting. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's horrific. I, I, I watched some of those again, some moments, and, and it, so many resonate in different ways. Those, the, just the reality that this is connected to science. People, well, you know, usually you watch something like this, and it's a zombie film. So it's some kind of, uh, you know, a toxic waste or something that causes it. And, you know, well, that's not going to happen. Right. But the science seems to be there to some degree. You know, mm -hmm. which was my, kind of my question, where, uh, how much research was put into uh, the, you know, while you're developing the series and how much was already established uh, with the video game? Not a ton with the video game, other than the fact that Cordyceps is real. I mean, Neil was inspired by this real thing, and that's a stroke of genius to not make it zombies, because there are a thousand mm -hmm. video games where you're fighting zombies, and the zombies occur because of a toxic waste or a virus or it's supernatural or whatever it may be. And Neil grounded it in this very real thing uh, that occurs in the insect world and is pretty horrifying. Um, I did a bit of research early on with um, studying my uh, mycology and talking to mycologists about the way fungi worked and functioned and some of the remarkable abilities they have and also how ubiquitous it is. Uh, one mycologist said, if you walk outside, if you see any grass or trees or dirt, there's fungi underneath it. Doesn't matter. Every single time. So this planet belongs to them as much as it belongs to us and maybe more so. And that was fascinating. I, I want to respect the enemy the way I respected radiation in Chernobyl. It's it's in, in, in some ways it's beautiful. We wanted to make it beautiful in the show. Um, Legasov refers to the functioning of a nuclear reactor as beautiful because it is. Um, right now, um, I think it is being reported more because of our show. It was always the case. There are fungi that are becoming uh, more and more temperature resistant to the heat of our bodies. That was always their challenge, was getting past the 98.6 degree threshold that we live in. And they are evolving. And they are evolving because the world is getting warmer. And they are very dangerous. And so the World Health Organization has issued quite a few bulletins about this. Will cordyceps take over our minds and our brains and turn us into zombies? Probably not. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. Will they make us very sick? Will they kill us? Yeah, if we don't get this under control. Yeah, and we are way behind in terms of how to combat those kinds of infections. Um, very hard to treat certain fungal infections without killing the person that you're treating. And that's scary. Yeah. Um, especially when you had, when, it, you know, this series is very much about family in, in different ways. And that's one thing is when you factor in, um, you know, if it's just you, things don't matter so much things, you know, there's not that much weight, but at the beginning, when you're watching a, a man trying to, help his daughter survive this impossible way to and, and unpredictable impossible to uh to manage situation and then uh at the end you got this kind of book ended with him deciding making other decisions that are just um you know just i i, I don't know they're they're I, i've I had discussions with people and and people disagree i, I most parents most fathers i've spoken with uh and parents as well uh, of all parents it's been yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, humanity. My daughter's coming home with me. Yep. And I kind of get it, but it's like, 
and then you feel, man, am, am I a bad person? But then, you know, there's just so much, you know, there's so much that you've thrown in here. I, I, I could ask you, I could talk to you for, for days on end, and I'm sure you could extend the, those days into to weeks, but <laughs> um, there's just so much that this series covers. That's what I, I blew my mind um, that I'm still, we're, we're like a month out and still processing and these great. things still pop up in my mind. You know, when you see the, uh, the fungi in the news, you're like, yeah. oh, please, no tendril kisses, please. please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll probably be able to avoid those, but I'm, I'm very glad that you're still thinking about it. And it is, you know, the, the, the challenge that we put out there really from the start, this is kind of how I crystallized what this is about, is about the downside of love and the dangerous things that love makes us think and do. Um, in fact, almost everything dangerous that we think and do is probably connected to love. And we don't like to think about love that way. You're right. He, we think about someone trying to protect his family. And the first question I have is why the family as opposed to anyone else? Is uh, my daughter worth your daughter's life? Is my daughter worth 12 people's lives, 100 people's lives? What is it about this selfish gene that is so selfish? And what is it about love that distorts our understanding of ethics, um, pure ethics? It just does. It, it smashes it to bits. In fact, the reason we have ethical discussions is because of love. Otherwise, it would just be simple. We wouldn't worry about it. But what Neil did in the in the story of the game, and that's absolutely what we carried through faithfully here, is is forces to confront that question at extremists. So, how many people is my child worth? How about the world? How about if it's not even my child? How about if it's just a kid that has fit into the child shaped hole in my heart where my daughter used to be? How many people is that kid worth? everyone and kathleen who's played by melanie linsky just articulates it i mean i'm a big believer that you should put all the clues there to hide nothing and just let people realize it was there in front of them the whole time when she's saying to henry what did you think sam was worth everything yes <laughs> that's the problem yeah. and when sam's gone she proves it that was everything that was everything and when melanie melanie loses her brother she loses her connection to morality. It's gone. There's, she's now just avenging the loss that cannot be, um, you know, satisfied by punishing, and the punishing will never end until it's done. And that's what is her downfall. That is what's her. Not only is it her downfall and her undoing, it's probably the undoing of the entire community that has survived in Kansas City because ultimately it unleashes a force far greater than even her own need for revenge. It's love that does it all. And we will continue to scrutinize that and push on that um, in the season to come. Excellent. Uh, just a couple more quick questions. I spoke with, uh, with Nico Parker yesterday ah, and she was wonderful, but yeah. uh, on, and on the series, she's tremendous. Yeah. My question to you is when you first watched it you know completely done ready to broadcast did you cry oh of course yeah well in fairness it's really the first time i i see you know like the director's cut where actually in my case because i was the director i'm seeing the editor's cut uh there and uh you know wonderful editor tim good who put it together and um that yes i i Absolutely. I cried and I cried multiple times. I kept crying over and over. Um, when we showed it at the premiere and it was on the big screen, I cried again. And, um, you know, it's always the, what I always cry at is, is Pedro's, his uh, denial. It's his refusal to accept that she's gone just for that brief moment, it's just so beautiful. Um, but it only works because Nico's pain, the pain that Nico is showing is so profoundly realistic. 
And one of the things that I remember saying to her that night was, pain is going to be the most pain you've ever felt. But even worse than that is fear. You are afraid. You can't, this is the most afraid you've ever been. This is the most, this is the thing that everybody should be the most afraid of. And that is dying too soon. And oh my God, did they both just deliver? It was, it's, yeah. And I also remember saying to Nico, because I like, I like torturing her a little bit. <laughs> She's very hard on herself. And I'm like, listen, if you want to be hard on yourself, let me tell you this. This moment where you die is the point upon which 5,000 tons of story is going to balance. This is the thing that makes everything happen. Everything will always, always come back to this in its own way. This, your death will even echo forward and become through Joel, a part of who Ellie is going forward in her life and the things that she's going to do. And so it's, I'm very proud of the fact that the two of them were able to deliver that performance that we could rest, not just one season on, but multiple seasons. Yeah. There's not a moment that Sarah is not on screen, you know, through Joel. And, and, and when you mentioned say it like the way you did, you know, the, the, the domino effect eventually into bigger and bigger dominoes to ones that can affect billions of people is just uh, because of one father's yeah. love for his daughter is beautiful, incredible, frightening. It's everything. It's love, you know, it's, it's love it's what it is. Love. So finish off with um, just, do you have any favorite scenes or moments that, that stand out, especially after when it's all said and done wrapped up and, and you, you get to watch it as, as a viewer? Sure. I have some moments. Um, I love the moment in episode four where it's after Ellie is shot the guy that was trying to kill Joel and she is scared and horrified by what she's done even though she has this inner propensity for violence she's never well we think she's never done it like that before and then we find out that she has and Joel tries to comfort her and fails but when she says to him hey this wasn't my first time he understands oh it's not that she was scared because she shot somebody She's traumatized. She's traumatized. But interestingly, as somebody who was also traumatized, his way to comfort her is to give her the gun back and to show her how to hold it. They bond over the one thing that they use to soothe their trauma. And that is their ability to control a chaotic world through violence. And that is obviously not healthy. And what we're watching are two people falling in love in a father-daughter way over something that most of us should not be falling in love over <laughs> um, because of trauma. And they played that so beautifully. They played it so well, I think a lot of people miss until eventually they sort of start to get it. It's dangerous. But the two of them together are creating something that's a little bit dangerous. And where it goes is the ultimate expression of that. But they are different. Um, and the difference between them is, is, is what's going to drive through later. Um, what they want is different. Only because Joel is a parent and Ellie is a child. And the thing that children don't have is children. That's the difference. That's why they want different things. But I, I, always, I love that moment. I love the way that they do it. Um, and I also, one of my favorite moments is in the final episode when Ellie says, so time heals all wounds. And Joel says, it wasn't time that did it. Um, it is the closest... In not only the moment he says it, but the moment after the silence between them, and then what Ellie kind of stammers out about how she's glad that that didn't work out. That's the closest these two can ever come to telling each other how they really feel. In fact, they will never tell each other how they really feel in a more expressive and clear way than that. That is what we are seeing there is the pinnacle 
of their honesty and with each other. And I, I'm very proud of that. That's, that's a, and they, they did it so well. They just did it so well. It's just a, a beautiful moment, I think. Yeah, their their chemistry on screen is just incredible. With and without it, everything else fails. So, you know, no to have them and and to pull it off in in such the complex emotional layers and, and the pain and all these things inside every word they say, there's something behind it that's not being said, and you see it in their performances, yeah. and you see them see it in each other, doubting each other, relationship, you know, that's, questioning that's, each other. That's yeah. what we go for always. Can you tell me anything about the upcoming season, your plans for it or your hopes for it? Um, no. <laughs> I will say, uh, well, my plans are to make something beautiful and great. Um, and let's see how we do. Um, but otherwise, uh, everything's under wraps as it should be. Sure. Uh, and I think... Uh, Needless to say, we made choices and we did things in this season that some people loved and some people didn't like, and that will continue. Um, we follow we follow our own course and we follow our own load stars, and we end up where we end, but we do it honestly. When we're done, we are proud of what we've done, and we do it to make something great, not to necessarily please one faction or another. Mm-hmm. Um we will continue to challenge and make things. I look, my, my goal ultimately is that people watch the season and think about it. And the more they think about it, whether they loved it initially, or maybe they're going to love it later that eventually they get to it, that they find it, you know? So, um, see how we do. Well, you're, you're betting a thousand in my book. So keep doing your thing. And, and, uh, I look forward to it. And let me close out with the, uh, a very simple question, three words to describe the last of us the series love is dangerous wow i like it i like it a lot thank you so much for your time thank you for your work on the series that uh, this and chernobyl i'm seriously instantly went to the the top of my all-time list um i whenever i get an opportunity to tell somebody like have you seen chernobyl <laughs> I, even my wife has not not watched it yet i'm like maybe i don't know if you should maybe you know consult a therapist first it's not for everyone <laughs> yeah it's it's a lot but it's it's, it's excellent lot. excellent and I, I think you know it, it gets the label important television i think people need to realize like you're saying we hear the threats but we ignore them we ignore them until they they're knocking at our door yeah. so i think these are, are good things to uh that you bring up here also Thanks. let me just say this uh nico said that she her biggest compliment is when people cry at her mm-hmm. performance so yeah. Congratulations. I you know, I don't know if she'll see this, but she is another one to add to the list. Oh, fantastic. But... <laughs> <laughs> very pleased with that. I'm very pleased. Well, thank you, Stephen. Right. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too, sir. Bye-bye. Bye now.